In an alternative world, a strange plague has wiped out most of the planet's population, with many of the survivors now being mutants who can only come out at night. Only one man stands in the apocalyptic world and wants to restore humanity, and that is a scientist called Robert Neville, played by Charlton Heston. Man, this guy does not have the best of luck when it comes to cinematic apocalypses. What with him seeing the end of humanity in Planet of the Apes, and the near society collapse in Soylent Green. He just can't catch a break! The terrifying mutants are known as the family, and they want to destroy Neville, as they see him as a threat to their newfound way of life. They hate him so much, they even harass him at his home while he's trying to have dinner. How rude! But that doesn't affect our hero Neville here. Nope, he still breaks out the velvet jacket and frilly shirt while drinking his finest whiskey and playing a one-man game of chess like a boss. You know, as you do when albino monsters are trying to kill you. <laughs> he looks like Austin Powers. Neville then meets a group of survivors led by Lisa, played by Rosalind Cash where they team up to try and find a way to avoid the sinister family of mutants and to also try and save humanity in this 1971 action-packed science fiction horror movie classic. So it's time to check out another apocalyptic movie from the 1970s as we look into 10 things that you didn't know about the Omega Man. You're gonna have a blast, I'm gonna have a blast, we're all going to have a blast together, so let's check it out! Yeah! Number 10, not the first or the last adaptation. Wait, is that Elijah Wood in the background there? Anyway, moving on. The Omega Man is indeed based on the 1954 novel I Am Legend, which was written by acclaimed writer Richard Matheson, whom has several writing credits to his name, including the novel The Shrinking Man, and even episodes of The Twilight Zone, and the screenplay for the TV movie Duel. Just like the Omega Man, I Am Legend sees a world in a state of apocalypse. However, in the book, it's due to a disease where many of the survivors are now vampire creatures. The book was a huge success, although considered quite violent and grotesque for its time, and it got the label of being the first modern vampire novel. However, the Omega Man isn't the first or last adaptation of this eerie story. The first adaptation of I Am Legend came out in 1964 with the movie The Last Man on Earth, which was shot in black and white and starred horror movie legend Vincent Price, who played the main surviving protagonist, now called Robert Morgan. Then in 2007 there was a third adaptation starring Will Smith called I Am Legend, which, unlike the first two movies, was actually named after the story that it was based off, starring Will Smith playing the lead part of Robert Neville. What's interesting is I Am Legend was originally going to feature Arnold Schwarzenegger as Robert Neville, until it became a Will Smith vehicle. And thankfully, while making this movie, I don't think he slapped anyone. In fact, the original I Am Legend book is such an influential story, it is said that it inspired George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead. And at one stage, British film production company Hammer Horror was going to make their own version of I Am Legend called The Night Creatures, but it was deemed too gruesome, so the project was scrapped. And their Night Creatures project evolved into a completely different movie, one starring Peter Cushing. So in essence, the I Am Legend book is a book that went a long way. Number nine, the producer would work on several collaborations with Charlton Heston. It is said that the wheels were set in motion for the creation of the Omega Man on this one occasion when actor Charlton Heston was in an airplane flying back on his way to Los Angeles, where he read the book I Am Legend, and instantly thought that it would make a great movie, as well as injecting current modern themes of the time into the book. You know, an updated version. Updated for the early 70s. It is also said that Heston was actually unaware that there already was a theatrical movie of the story, 
the as mentioned The Last Man on Earth. According to IMDB, Heston would approach Orson Welles to direct, but nothing came of it. So instead, American director Boris Segal was ultimately hired as director. Segal had directed many TV shows, including episodes of The Twilight Zone, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Columbo, and The Man from UNCLE. The producer of The Omega Man would be Walter Seltzer, who actually has a long history of working with Heston, having produced many movies that the actor had starred in, including The Warlord, Will Penny, and Number One. And the collaboration didn't end with The Omega Man, as after the movie, the actor and producer duo would go on to make Skyjacked, Soylent Green, and The Last Hard Men. So clearly, Heston and Seltzer must have had a good working relationship. I mean, come on, look at how many movies they made. Number 8. Changes for the Screen So there are actually several major differences between the Omega Man and the book it's based on I Am Legend. The most standout difference is the infected people themselves. In the book it's explained it's a disease which is spread by bats and mosquitoes that has transformed many people into vampire creatures. However, the Omega Man's co-writer, Joyce Hooper Corrington, who co-wrote the movie with her husband, John William Corrington, wanted to update this premise. And being a doctor of chemistry, she felt that a more viable way to create the diseased people was through biological warfare, in which the movie described was created by a war between Russia and China. So in the Omega Man, the diseased people aren't so much vampires, but rather a tribe, or in this case, a family of slightly civilized mutants who have gray skin and can't be in direct sunlight. But thankfully, they're able to get their hands on some pretty funky sunglasses. Jump to the Will Smith I Am Legend movie, and the infected were changed again. This time they were basically the zombie creatures from 28 Days Later, and they had elongated CGI mouths for some reason. Another big difference is the Robert Neville character himself. In the book, there is the shock revelation that Neville isn't the protagonist we've all been led to believing him to be, but is actually the antagonist, as it's revealed that the infected is now the new evolution of humanity, and Neville is now part of a bygone era who threatens their new way of life. He is a past representation of the old, hence the story's title, I Am Legend. Whereas in the Omega Man, there is no moral question over the character. He is our action-packed, gun-firing hero for the evening. Huh, <laughs> awesome. An article by Jovial J for the website RetroZap has a comment that I absolutely love and sums up this situation. Where the article says, quote, Instead of creating any ambiguity over the hero of the film, Heston is downright presented as a modern-day Jesus Christ. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, after all, the movie literally ends with Neville in a crucifixion pose. But as far as storytelling goes, I don't think these changes are a bad thing. In many ways, I think it actually improves the story. But more on that later. Interestingly, I Am Legend would also follow this template of the main character being a savior of the human race who sacrifices himself in order to preserve a cure, rather than just accept that he's an old, outdated way of life like in the book. I honestly think the mutants in Omega Man are pretty creepy. That is, apart from the whole wearing sunglasses indoors thing. I mean, come on, who does that? Number 7. Casting So when it comes to the casting, as established, the role of Robert Neville was played by Charlton Heston, who at that time was a movie tough guy, who in his day starred in many action movies. When it came to the character Lisa, who is a normal human co-survivor of the apocalypse, as well as having a romantic relationship with Neville, several actresses were considered, including Judy Pace and Diane Carroll. But actress Rosalind Cash was cast in the role. Now this was groundbreaking at the time, as interracial love affairs just weren't really seen in movies when the Omega Man was made, but the production actively wanted the character of Lisa to be played by an African American woman, to demonstrate that in an apocalyptic world, with very few survivors, those survivors wouldn't care about racial issues. Co-script writer Joyce Hooper Corrington added that she wanted to add some quote, black power into the movie. And Heston and Cash do have an amazing chemistry, and the kiss that they share in the Omega Man is considered the first, or at least one of the first, interracial kisses in movie history. 
However, Cash was worried about her love scenes with Heston, as she saw him as Moses thanks to his role of Moses in the movie The Ten Commandments. According to Heston, she felt weird about, quote, screwing Moses. <laughs> yeah, I get it. And of course, we got the movie's big bad, Jonathan Matias, who starts off as a news anchor, but then becomes the leader of the family. He was played by actor Anthony Zerb, but I'll always know him as the exploding head man from License to Kill. Lincoln Kilpatrick starred as Zachary, and he would go on to star with Charlton Heston in Soylent Green as the priest. And Eric Lanaville starred as Richie. He would go on to star in the Chuck Norris movie, A Force of One, and later down the track would direct episodes of NCIS Los Angeles. Number six, filming in Los Angeles. Filming commenced in October and November 1970, and most of the filming of Omega Man took place around Los Angeles. But this proved quite tricky, as the environment in the movie had to be an abandoned, empty, post-apocalyptic one. So how the heck can you create a post-apocalyptic world in a bustling Los Angeles? Well, there was an idea to build a set, but it was felt that that would cost too much. However, one weekend, a member of the crew drove down some LA streets and saw that there weren't really any shoppers and came to the conclusion that people don't seem to go out shopping on weekends. Well, not in the 1970s anyway. So most of the Los Angeles scenes were filmed on weekends when there weren't really many people out and about. Although apparently in some shots in the background, you can see the odd person walking around or the odd car driving past. But if so, it's not very obvious. I mean, I didn't notice anything. The role of Neville was a very physically demanding one for Heston. For example, he had to learn how to ride a motorbike as he had never done so before. Heston would go on to say that during the making of the Omega Man, he was starting to get tired of the action hero roles. I mean, I guess you can't blame him. He had starred in so many and he was getting a bit older. And he supposedly also said that the movie's director, Boris Segal, often lost his temper at the crew. Neville's fortress home was a built set, and apparently it's currently located at Warner Brothers Burbank Studios. And it actually hasn't changed since the filming of the Omega Man, and it is sitting directly behind the fountain from the Friends TV show intro. Yeah. And according to IMDB, Neville's home can even be seen on Google Maps 3D. Well, there you go, that's a thing. But I know what you're all thinking. What ties do the Omega Man have with Doctor Who? Uh, actually, you probably weren't thinking it, as I only just mentioned it. So... Number five, Omega Who. Yes, indeed, the funky and groovy 1970s music that features in the Omega Man was composed by Australian composer Ron Grainer. Now, you may be thinking... Who's Ron Grainer? Well, he's a very important person in the geek nerdom community, as he created the Doctor Who theme. Yep, the iconic classic theme all the way back in 1963. You know, that theme that goes da 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 dum da 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 dum da 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 dum 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 da da dum da dum and so on and so forth, becoming one of the most iconic themes in science fiction. Now, Grainer has composed several movie scores, including the 1967 classic To Sir With Love but he was mainly known for his work for British television, also creating music for Steptoe and Son and The Prisoner. I just find it so random that a guy who mainly composes music for British TV would then one day out of nowhere would score a Hollywood movie about apocalyptic zombies. But regardless, his score is great and it really sounds of its time. It has a fun 1970s kish about it, but it also has heart and soul too. And to be honest, I think it's a shame that he didn't go on to score more big Hollywood movies, as his music for the Omega Man is vastly celebrated. Number four, the Omega Man would lead to the creation of a popular TV series. A standout moment in the Omega Man is at the start of the movie where Neville is driving around an abandoned Los Angeles and then visits an abandoned movie theater to watch the movie Woodstock, which comes complete with extended scenes from that movie. The Woodstock movie was a documentary about the Woodstock Festival which took place in 1969, and it was released one year prior to the Omega Man. Over the years, this has led many people to ask what year does the Omega Man take place? 
Now, the movie was released in 1971, but it is actually set a few years after that. Now, there's a common belief that it is set in 1975, but it's actually set in 1977. Yep, sadly, there won't be any Star Wars in that alternative 1977 universe. Clips from the movie Woodstock were able to be used for the Omega Man, as both movies were distributed by Warner Brothers. Not only that, but Woodstock was a huge box office hit when it was released, becoming one of the highest grossing movies of 1970, and one of the highest grossing movies for Warner Brothers in general. So promoting the movie in the Omega Man definitely wouldn't have hurt. However, love and peace aside, featuring Woodstock in the Omega Man would play a very important part in pop culture, as it led to the creation of the popular TV show Mystery Science Fiction Theater 3000. You see, the shot of Charlton Heston sitting in a lone theater, watching a movie and interacting with it, gave Mystery Science Fiction Theater 3000's writer and star Joel Hodgson the idea of him and his comical robotic co-stars to sit in a lone theater in an apocalyptic world setting, where they watch movies and comment on them, which led to the formula of what the show would become. So the next time you watch The Omega Man, and you see that scene of Charlton Heston watching Woodstock, you're actually also watching the genesis of Mystery Science Fiction Theater 3000. But what other major influences has The Omega Man had on pop culture? Number 3. The Omega Man, a pop cultural celebration. It seems that the Omega Man has a vast collection of fans from all over the world, some of whom have used the movie as inspiration for their own creativity. With the creation of an Argentinian comic called Mark. Oh, well, that's an interesting name. Which acts as a spin-off taking place in the same apocalyptic world seen in the Omega Man. To a 1981 song by the pop group The Police called, well, Omega Man. Which, as you guessed, is based on the movie. And of course, it wouldn't be a true pop cultural phenomenon if it wasn't parodied by The Simpsons, in which in the episode Treehouse of Horror 8 features a story called The Homega Man, which sees Springfield being destroyed by nuclear explosions, where Homer is the last man left alive, who at first is enjoying his newfound freedom of being the last man left in Springfield. But then, a la the Omega Man, he gets terrorized by the residents who survived, who are now bloodthirsty mutants, where they naturally go after Homer. So it seems from Sting to Homer to Crow T. Robot, the Omega Man has touched many people's lives. But the Omega Man franchise would even go on to reference itself, as when Warner Brothers would go on to release the Will Smith version, I Am Legend, in 2007, that movie's poster uses a tagline that kind of, sort of, rips off the Omega Man's movie poster tagline, as the Omega Man's tagline is, The Last Man Alive Is Not Alone, whereas the tagline for I Am Legend is, The Last Man On Earth Is Not Alone. Look, it's basically the same! Look at that! They pretty much just recycled the same tagline. Um, I guess why create a new tagline when you've already got one on standby? Um. Number two, deleted scene. So there is a notorious scene that was cut from the Omega Man, and it actually would have been a very powerful scene. Now, there are some suggestions that the scene was shot, but ultimately removed from the final film. But there are also other claims that it wasn't filmed, but did feature in the movie's script. So here's the lowdown of what happened. The Lisa character goes to a cemetery to visit her parents' graves. While at the cemetery, she sees a female mutant disposing of the body of a dead mutant infant. Lisa stares at what's happening, but can't bring herself to kill the mutant, as she sees the pain and loss in the mutant mother's face. Lisa goes back to tell Neville what happened, and he asked her if she took care of business. And Lisa explained that she couldn't bring herself to kill a grieving mother, as she herself is pregnant. Where Neville is immediately shocked, and following this, he and Lisa then embrace. Look, I can see why this scene was cut out. Maybe it was felt that adding this subplot was a little too morbid especially given the final outcome of the film, and maybe takes it to a dark and unpleasant place. After all, The Omega Man wants to be a fun action movie as well as being a story with philosophical themes. But who knows? That's just me guessing. Maybe it was removed for time and pacing reasons. 
Even though the scene is a mystery, I'm more in the opinion that it was filmed, as the end credits even list the character of the woman at the cemetery as actress Anna Ares, the actress whose picture I've been using for this segment. But once again, who knows, maybe she was cast, but the scene wasn't shot. But yeah, for her to be in the credits, I'm guessing it was shot. So if the scene does exist, it'll be interesting to see if it ever does turn up from a Warner Brothers vault somewhere, because I'll be interested in seeing it, and I'm sure many other fans would too. Number one, its initial reaction was mixed. The Omega Man was released in July 1971 and would make a tidy but not spectacular profit of $4 million. Interestingly, it actually made more money than Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which like the Omega Man was a big event movie that was released in 1971. In fact, just one month prior to the Omega Man. And according to mthenumbers.com, only made $3.4 million. The Omega Man didn't get very good reviews from critics, with most of the reviews being kind of average at best, with many criticisms, such as the movie's ending, as well as it appearing to be too ridiculous and too fast-paced. But some did agree that the movie was enjoyable enough, at least as a Saturday matinee filler. Many also considered it to be too violent. The author of the book it's based on, Richard Matheson, also wasn't a fan of the movie, and seemed to really not like the changes made to his story. And in a rather catty statement, he said, quote, The Omega Man was so removed from my book that it didn't even bother me. Which I guess is kind of his way of saying that the movie isn't even worth his time or bother. Director Tim Burton, on the other hand, absolutely loves it saying that he doesn't know why it's one of his favourite movies, but it just is, and that if it's ever on TV, he'll stop whatever he's doing and watch it, as he can't get enough of the Omega Man. Yep, Tim Burton is an Omega Man fanboy. A Omega fan, if you will. Now, to conclude, the Omega Man is definitely a relic of its time, with all its 1960s and 70s isms. A time when biological warfare was increasingly being brought to the arena of conversation. It's a reflection of what may happen if we destroy ourselves and lose our humanity. That's one of the reasons why it's so different to the book it's based on, I Am Legend, which is determined to be rid of humanity as we know it, in favour of a new evolved species. Whereas the Omega Man wants to be more optimistic and determined to preserve our humanity as we know it. The two different contrasts show two completely different visions. One of these visions say, let go, embrace the new order, your time is done. The other one says, no, hold on to who you truly are at all costs and find a way. So in that regard, the Omega Man definitely has more hope. Now both stories are great in their own way and they are both very provocative. But the Omega Man teaches us to never lose hope and to embrace humanity and to always try and find the answers and solutions in conflict. And to do it while wearing some pretty fly velvet. And I believe the Omega Man's true message is why it stood the test of time and has become a beloved classic. Okay, dudes, that was my look into the Omega Man and I hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned a thing or two and had a good chuckle here and there. If you like old school apocalypse movies like Soylent Green, then you should definitely check out the Omega Man. It's fun, but insightful. Anyway, I'm Minty, and if the world ever does become ravaged by light-sensitive mutants, well, they ain't taking my sunglasses. I've already called dibs on them. See ya!